here's a snapshot of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, starting at 9.30 a.m., we have Sunday school for all ages. At 11 a.m., we start our morning worship. During service, expect powerful praise and worship, preaching and teaching. And every third Sunday, we have youth outreach service. While you're in service, we have a nursery for toddlers, and for ages 5 to 13, Children's Church. Every first Sunday evening, we have missionary service, and all are welcome. And then, on Wednesdays, don't miss out on Abundant Life Institute at 12 noon and 6.30 p.m. We have youth Bible study for kindergarten through college, Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. at the same time as Abundant Life Institute. For more information on our weekly services, announcements, and upcoming events, please visit www.breadhouseministries.org. Welcome to the Bread House International Ministries. We are a church for all people. Thank you for joining us today, and our hope is that you experience the fruit of God's Spirit. Bless you, friends. Good to have you back with us on this wonderful series that we're teaching on here at the Bread House. Uh, we're so grateful and we thank you for joining in with us on our Abundant Life series and our Abundant Life teachings weekly. And we certainly hope and pray that what you've already heard and what you've been experiencing from the Word of God have really blessed you tremendously. We're just talking about uh, the wisdom uh, of God from above. We're not uh, complicated. We're not complicating anything, but we're trying to stay real simple uh, with just practical teaching that can impact everyday life. Uh, I know in the time that we live in, we need more Christians that are, that are living examples of what Christ is talking about. You might ask, uh, uh, what do you mean when we talk about this? But uh, our series is entitled Partnering with Heaven. And you might ask, what do, what do you mean when you say partnering with heaven? What I, what I mean when I say partnering with heaven is I'm saying that it's important, it's imperative that we as believers align our wills with the will of God. There's a whole lot of things that we can align ourselves with in our lives. And, and some of them may be important, some of them may not be as important, but one of the things that is extremely important is that all of God's people align their will and their purpose with the purpose that God has for us. Amen. I believe that it's especially critical in the day that we live in that we get in alignment with heaven uh, so that uh, we can be more impactful to the world that's, that's around us. Kind of like Jesus uh, during his public ministry, you know, he shared several uh, in several instances in scripture where he talks about the fact uh, that he came to do the will of the Father. As a matter of fact, in Hebrews, and we've shared these scriptures before, 10 and 9 says, Then he said, Lo, I come, into, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So he was aligning everything he did with the will of the, of the Father, Amen. And uh, so that he can accomplish the task. In Hebrews 10 and 7, it says, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. Uh, it is written of me to do thy will. And what he was referring to was the prophecies that had went before him that was talking about the Messiah and what he was supposed to do and what he was supposed to accomplish. accomplish. So he said, uh, search the scriptures. He told some of those that were uh, rejected him. He said, search the scriptures because in them you, you think you have life, but they're the thing, they're the ones that testify of me. And then uh, certainly, you know, in one of the difficult points in his life when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was struggling uh, with going to the cross. It wasn't the spirit that was struggling, it was the fleshly man. Uh, he said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He found out that there's something about this human condition uh, that has a, 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 a problem lining up with, with God's will. But thank God, Jesus partnered with heaven 
and, and in order to bring salvation to the world. And that's exactly what he did. Uh, and you may be even asking today, uh, why do I need to partner with heaven if Jesus already accomplished those things? It shouldn't be anything I should do. Amen. But God desires to use you. God desires to use each and every one that will allow him uh, to use them. Amen. Uh, to reach souls for the kingdom. That's the reason why the scripture says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. Because God, uh, through the spirit, he uses you and I, to impact the world. Amen. Uh, have no doubt about it that God is in the soul-saving business. That's his main purpose. That's what the gospel, the good news of the kingdom is about. That's what the sacrifice on the cross was about. Uh, that's what everything is about, is saving souls. That's the business he's in. And because God's in the soul-saving business, then you and I, a man should be in the soul saving business as well. Second Peter three and nine puts it like this. The Lord is not slack concerning his his promises as some man uh, count slackness, but but he's long suffering uh, to us word, not willing that any should perish. It's, it's not his will that any should perish, but it's his will that all men would come to repentance. So the goal of everything is repentance. And, and in 1 Timothy 2 and 4, it said, uh, who will have all men to come into the knowledge of the truth. So uh, the goal is to have everyone come into a knowledge of the truth. And hopefully uh, through that knowledge, it will result in repentance. And we're going to talk about this a little later in, in this series, but uh, uh, as as children of God, as children of the kingdom, we are the lights in the world. We're the ones uh, that uh, can demonstrate to the world the power of Christ in our life. Amen. And God the Father needs as many of us to shine as lights in this dark and dying world. Amen. And it starts by not conforming to the world, but being transformed amen, and conforming to heaven, amen. So we thank God for this series, as Jesus was teaching in this, in this series of Sermon on the Mount, he began to speak about uh, the need, amen, not explicitly, but, but uh, uh, when you read it and you understand it, amen, how that if we kingdom citizens would partner with the will of God, partner with heaven, then we can have maximum impact in the world. Uh, we can impact those that are looking for something genuine, something true, amen, he, looking for uh, something that's just not spoken of, but demonstrated, amen. Uh, uh, and Jesus here in this sermon, he began to talk about not only what is expected of kingdom citizens, for maximum impact while we're here on earth. But one of the good things about it is he always, he always uh, added what we as kingdom citizens can expect from him, from heaven, in return for being obedient and walking in unison and walking as one with the will of God. Amen. We can expect great blessings. We can expect uh, great blessings that have uh, eternal implications, blessings that that will impact us not just in the here and now, now but in the hereafter. Amen. So, so God is a great God. We've been talking uh, in part one through part four of this series. We've kind of been individually examining in, on a on a individual basis. Uh, the, the Beatitudes, the, the things that where God promised a blessing behind it. We started off talking about uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Then we, we, we talked about uh, those who mourn, blessed are those who mourn. And then it's talked about blessed are the meek. 
Amen. And then last week we talked about blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Amen. And each one of them had a blessing that uh, went along with it. For example, the poor in spirit, the scripture lets us know uh, that uh, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it was really dealing with the foundation of, of, of being blessed. It, it, it was the prerequisite, if you will, uh, to all the other ones that we, we've been talking about. It's at its foundation. And what it's really saying is unless we feel uh, that without God in our life, we're bankrupt, we're, we're lacking. Uh, we have a feeling that, that God has something for me and I need it because when we have that feeling, that's when we'll, we'll ask him for it. That's when we'll knock on his door. That's when we will, we'll see. So at the foundation, the prerequisite there was that we start off understanding uh, our lack on individual basis before we can ask. And certainly uh, the scripture lets us know in Hebrews is, uh, 6 and 11, or 11 and 6, one of the two, it says, it said, except before a man come to God, he must believe that he is, that he exists, and that not only that he exists, but he's a rewarder of those that diligently or seriously or earnestly seek after him. So we won't seek after him unless we uh, understand our need. When we feel like we have everything in our control and we don't really need God, we don't need anything, we'll never ask him, we'll never knock, we'll never seek. So he said, I, I need kingdom citizens to first understand that how depleted they are without me and how much we need him. And then he added, uh, the, the second one, he said, blessed are those who mourn. Amen. And really this, this is, uh, this in a sense is, uh, coming to the place where we look inwardly and we see where we are as individuals. And then we look outwardly and we see where the world is and, and understand something about what God is really trying to do in terms of saving souls and delivering people from bondage. Uh, so he said, blessed are those that mourn. Amen. And, and, and when we when we mourn, it's because we feel what heaven feels. We see what heaven sees. Amen. Uh, so uh, Jesus doing his public ministry, it was some sometime he would groan on the inside because he after he looked at. Uh, the people scattered like sheep without a shepherd. After he looked at the condition of unbelief and the lack of faith, it would cause him to groan inside and, and feel sorry because he understands that the kingdom of heaven has so much uh, in store for those that would just believe and just receive. Amen. So Jesus would mourn. So when we see things like heaven sees it and feel things like heaven feel, it will cause us to have a heaviness in our heart. Uh, when we see uh, the destruction in the world, destruction of souls, it should cause you and I to have a heaviness in our heart so that we mourn, we stand in the gap, if you will, for those souls that are, that are, that are lost. Uh, kind of like uh, King David, and we shared this where uh, God spoke, of him as a man after his own heart. Amen. David uh, was, was a man after God's own heart, and he always wanted things to be right with his God. He had his own issues. Uh, he had his own situations. Uh, but when it came to the things of God, amen, he was serious about the things of God. Amen. And, and in the same way, we talked about Jesus considering. So so we started off with poor in spirit, went to those that mourn. And next we talked about the meek. Blessed are the meek. You know, sometimes we can feel like God is talking to someone else when we talk about meekness and we can feel like meekness is weakness. Amen. But let me tell you something. Meekness is not becoming a doormat. It's not uh, weakness, but what it is, is strength under control. Amen. It's power under control. Amen. When we're, when we're meek enough to let God rule in our hearts. Amen. Then we're in a blessed place. 
man, when we can allow God to really manifest himself through our lives. Uh, and then we last week, we talked about those that hunger and thirst after righteousness and not self-righteousness, but his righteousness. Amen. And we talked about scripture found in Matthew 6 and 33, when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other stuff will be added unto you. So God has a righteousness, the kingdom of heaven, heaven has a righteousness that exists with it. And it's not something that's complicated. It's not something that that's difficult, but it's extremely important when we start talking about coming in alignment, partnering with heaven, uh, playing our role as kingdom citizens and being effective and, and impactful. Paul was very concerned during his public ministry. He said, I don't want to just be air. I don't want to just, you know, fight and not obtain. He said, but I fight. I, 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 I do it in a way so that I can win souls. Amen. He's not doing it so he can waste time. And you all know he, he made statements like when I'm with the Greeks, I'm as the Greeks, when I'm with the Romes, I'm in Rome, you know, those type of things. But what he was really saying is I'm, I'm walking in wisdom so that I can be impactful wherever I go and whoever I come in contact with. So today we're, we're, we're shifting into uh, the next beatitude, which is Matthews 5 and 7. Where, where it says, blessed are the merciful, amen, for they shall obtain mercy. And this is a very powerful uh, 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 scripture. Uh, and, I, and the part I really like about it is the merciful are the ones that shall obtain mercy, shall receive mercy. And you might ask, okay, what does it mean to really be merciful? Man, because we need to have the right concept of what it means to be merciful. And, and, and when I looked up some of the definitions and the meanings of this word, it, it really means to help the afflicted are those in need of help. Amen. We're not being merciful when we're helping people that don't need help. I mean, we're not being merciful if there's not a real issue or real concern about help. So it's, it has to do with uh, looking up on the afflicted, helping those that are that are in need to help. Of, in, in other words, provide, pro providing help for the wretched, amen, those that are undone, those uh, that may look like they don't deserve mercy, amen, but it's, it's really providing help for the wretched. wretched. It's, it's having compassion on the miserable, amen. S sometime uh, it can be people that don't even... Uh, uh, see themselves as having any value and and see themselves as worthy of anything. But 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 Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He, he said, blessed are those that are full of kindness, that are full of pity, that are full of compassion. Amen. On others that that are full of not full of themselves, not full of their self-worth, not full of uh, their self-value, but, but, but full of kindness and pity and compassion for others. Amen. This is a kingdom message, and it's important for us, and I, and I think this is a good point here, it's important for us to realize in order to really understand what Jesus is teaching here requires spiritual insight. It doesn't work if we look at it from a natural perspective, if it doesn't work if we look at it from a from an earthly perspective. It doesn't work if we look at it from a selfish perspective because the world is built up on dog eat dog. The world is built up on uh, self-focus, self-grandizing. Uh, the world is built up on uh, praising oneself. The world system is built on individual success. And man, not that those things are uh, necessarily bad, but they are bad when we when we when we t transpose those things onto God because God is different uh, than what we are amen God's system is a kingdom of righteousness it's a kingdom amen of justice and fairness and all of those type of things but it's very difficult uh, to really sense and see everything God is saying and what he's talking about unless we are transformed 
Amen. Uh, we must be born again. That's the reason why Jesus told Nicodemus in uh, St. John uh, 3 and 3, and he said, said that Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I truly, truly, I say unto thee, except a man is born again. Amen. He can't even see. He can't even perceive, can't even sense, uh, can't discern, will not be able to understand uh, the kingdom of God, will not be able to understand the things of God. So it's just, just practical things here that we really need to get a grasp of uh, as kingdom citizen. And it'll sound strange. You know, many of the things that Jesus talked about sound strange to the audience of his day. They, matter of fact, that's why they crucified him, because they didn't like the message. It was too different from what they uh, were uh, into. Jesus talked about something that was totally different from the mindset of those that were around him. It sounds strange to their, their human psyche. Amen. So unless we're born again, amen, unless there's a transformation, uh, unless that mind that was in Christ is in us, unless that, that our old man is translated into a new way of thinking, a new way of looking at things, it's going to be hard to digest things that are just extremely simple, not complicated, it's not no big theory or anything, it's very plain, it's hard to digest, amen, when you've been taught all of your life to fight, and when you've been taught all of your life to, life to strive with others, Amen. I like what Paul told Timothy. He said the, the, the servant of the Lord should not strive. Amen. I'm, I'm so glad that I have a God that can defend himself. I don't have to go on a jihad. I don't have to do anything to defend him. I will uh, uh, speak my mind. I will share truth. But I, I never have to get down in the gutter to defend my God because my God can defend himself. Amen. He's not in a hurry. He's not panic. He's, he's not get, he's, he's not a sensitive God. He can take care of his business. So unless we have a spiritual mindset, a spiritual transformation, it, it's hard to digest. Amen. This type of thinking. Amen. God uh, does not ask. And, and, and this this is one of the things I, I want really to stick in your spirit is that God really doesn't, act, does, he does not ask us to do anything that he's not willing to do himself. God is a fair God, amen. He didn't even give his own son, Jesus, to be the sacrificial lamb for the world uh, without a man, a uh, uh, tested man to see if man would do it. You all know the story of Abraham when he told him to go up to the the, the mountain and sacrifice his son. And when Abraham walked in obedience and began to do that, then God told him uh, to hold your hand when he was getting ready to sacrifice. He said, don't do it. He said, now I know that you love me. I know that you'll do it. And he tested him. He allowed him to be tested. There was a ram in the bush and caught in the bush and he had a sacrifice there for him. But God, the, he, he won't ask us to do things that he's not already doing. Man, God is a fair God. He's a just God. Amen. And for that, I am thankful. Man, he said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And, and you, you know, scripture lets us know that God has been merciful to mankind throughout all history and all creation. Amen. It's evident when you look at scriptures, God's mercy is all about the salvation of man. God's mercy is all about saving souls and, he and healing people and, and redeeming people. And, you know, God's mercy uh, uh, includes enough compassion to cover every human need now and forever. Anything you need, anything I need from God, his mercy can cover it. His mercy is, is, is from everlasting to everlasting. God is a merciful God. He's never turned down anyone, amen, who has come to him in faith <laughs> according to his word. Anyone that come to him in faith according to his word, he never turns down. 
because his mercies are renewed day after day. His mercies <clears throat> are one of, the, some, one of the most powerful things that we have, and he never turns down anything, anyone that walks to him and come to him face. Matter of fact, the scripture says the sacrifices of the Lord is a broken heart and a contrite spirit. Amen. Whenever God sees a see brokenness and he sees someone that want to come in alignment with his word, his mercy is there for those. His mercy uh, towards us really opens the door for all of his blessings. Amen. I, I just thank God for his mercy, because if it hadn't have been for his mercies, there wouldn't be any forgiveness. If it hasn't hadn't been for his mercy, there wouldn't be any redemption. If it hadn't been for his mercy, it wouldn't be any deliverance. If it hadn't been for his mercy, mercy, we wouldn't know what healing is. Our. We wouldn't know what wholeness is. We wouldn't know what health is. So we thank God for his mercy. We thank God for his goodness. Uh, and just a couple of scriptures to kind of uh, 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 show that how merciful God is. And I think I want to share a few of them uh, just so you can jot them down and study them later. Amen. Exodus 20 and 6, when God was talking to his, per to his children and he was talking about generations, he was talking about how if they keep his word and keep his commandments in verse number six, it said, and showing mercy unto thousands, amen, of them that love me and keep my commandments. See, uh, when we talk about when Jesus was here saying, blessed, is, blessed are the merciful, he was really talking about people uh, that understand and will keep his word and will keep his commandments. Amen. Exodus 34, 6 and 7, it said, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, amen, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, and abundant in goodness and truth. Amen. He, you know, here God is pat, patting himself on the, on, the, on the shoulder just a little bit, patting himself on the back just a little bit, using words that are powerful, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Verse seven, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquities and transgressions and sins uh, that will by no means, it, it, just because he does that, he said he's by no means is he going to clear the guilty. He, he also visited the iniquities of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children, upon the third and fourth generation. But it doesn't change the fact that God is not merciful. Amen. Anybody that turns and, and walk in his word, amen, God is at ready to show mercy. Psalms 86 and 15 puts it like this. He said, but thou, O Lord are a God full of compassion. Amen. I'm so thankful for that. Full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering. Amen. Plenteous in mercy, mercy and truth. Amen. It's hard to, it's really hard to see this and understand this if, if, if I walked all my life fighting, uh, contending, arguing, and debating, Amen. It's hard to, to see a merciful God. It's hard to understand a merciful God. Hebrews in the New Testament puts it like this in 8 and 12. Hebrews 8 and 12 says, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will, be, will I remember no more. Isn't it wonderful that, uh, that God doesn't hold grudges against his people? He, he, he don't remember the iniquities and the sins, amen, once we uh, turn to him and repent and confess faults, confess sins, and, and walk before him uprightly. God takes pleasure in, in that, amen. He, he, he loves it uh, when, when, when his people uh, walk in mercy and walk humbly before him and, and, and extend mercy. Micah 7 and 18 said, who is a God like our unto our God. We just thank God today that there's none like him. I, you know, I, I, I'm so thankful every time I, I study these Beatitudes and I study the mindset of heaven. 
I really come to appreciate more uh, the type of God that we serve. He said, who is like our God? Who is like unto thee that pardons iniquity, that forgives iniquity, forgives sin? Amen. And and passes by the transgression of the of the, the remnant of his heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever. Amen. Certainly God gets angry. Certainly God uh, deals with things, but he doesn't retain it forever. He doesn't hold grudges forever. Amen. You know how sometimes some people, they never forget. They say they forgive, but as soon as you get into a conflict with them, Later on, they start bringing up everything. And I don't don't think I forgot what you did 20 years ago. Don't think I forgot what you, you know. But God, this God, our God, he, he, he doesn't bring up things. He doesn't retain things. Amen. And he, because he delights in, in, in mercy. He, he, he's a merciful God and he likes it when he sees mercy being extended to others. I know that might say or sound strange. Uh, when we put him, try to put him in our shoes and get him to be just like us. But God is, you, do you know what would happen if God's anger would not ever calm down and be appeased? We would be consumed if God wasn't such a merciful God. Psalms 145 and 8 puts it like this. He said, the Lord is gracious and he's full of compassion. He's slow to anger and he's great in mercy. Amen. Amen. God doesn't ask us to do anything that he's not. That's not part of him. And one more scripture in this point here, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, it says, Blessed be God, even the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of mercies. So he's even the father of mercies. Amen. If, if you want to understand mercy, we just got to know him. Amen. He's the father of mercy and the God of all comfort. Amen. He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all of our tribulations. Amen. And that we may be able to comfort. See, and, and here's here's something that I think we need to really catch. He said he comforts us in all our tri tribulations so that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble by the comfort of wherewith he, we ourselves have been comforted of. Here's, here's what he's saying here in a nutshell. He's saying that if, if he comfort you and me, then we should be the first ones to comfort somebody else. Amen. If he showed compassion to you and I, then we should be the, the first ones to show compassion to others. If he showed mercy on us and he's a God of comfort, we should be able to comfort others that are in trouble, that are in tribulation, that are dealing with things, that are wretched, amen, that are in a place uh, where they need help. He said uh, that, that, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble, amen. It's no sense talking about having mercy on folks that don't need mercy, amen. Anytime we have mercy to give, it's got to be given to somebody that really don't deserve it, amen. So, uh, he said, those that are in trouble, and, and we do it by the comfort wherewith uh, we ourselves are comforted of God. Amen. We're talking about partnering with heaven. We're talking about getting alignment with God's will and God's purpose uh, for our life. Jesus teaches the kingdom principle here when he says in, in Matthew 5 and 7, he said, blessed are the merciful. Amen. Blessed are the merciful. For why? Because they're going to be obtain mercy. See, Jesus here had foresight and insight. He understood that those who would show mercy are most likely those who recognize that they have received mercy. Amen, somebody. Those who would show mercy are, are those that understand the mercy that they receive. Those that's able to comfort somebody else really have a fix on how much they've been comforted by God. Amen. Just wisdom from above. Amen. It's the mercy of God, as we've been reading and studying these Beatitudes, it's the mercy of God to be emptied. Amen. To be emptied. Amen. It's the mercy of God to be emptied of one's own pride. Amen. And recognize 
one's own poverty as it relates to the spirit of God. It's the mercy of God uh, when he shows us how much we need him, when he shows us how, how wretched and undone we are without him working in our lives. Uh, I propose that if there's anyone that come to God and feel like they're coming to God because uh, they're good. And, you know, anytime, you know, sometimes we can come to God in our self-righteousness as if God selected us because of who we are and where we are. Every one of us were wretched. Every one of us needed God in the worst way. Every one of us lacked a man, spiritual connectivity with him. Every one of us needed everything that God has for us. But until we recognize how wretched and how poor in our spiritual connection we are with God, amen, we won't understand the importance of mercy. We won't understand how merciful God had been towards us, amen, because of where we are. It's his mercy towards us that, that uh, brings each of us into a place where we begin to see our own wretched, our own internal wretchedness, and not only that, but look outwardly and look at the wretchedness of the fallen world. Amen. Because until we see it like that, we'll never uh, really mourn for ourselves nor the world until we have spiritual insight. Amen. And spiritual foresight. We won't be able to feel what heaven feels and see what uh, heaven sees. We won't see the falling condition of the world. And because we don't see the falling condition of the world, we struggle showing mercy on those that are falling in the world. Amen. It's, 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 it's his mercy, amen, to show us and to cause us to recognize how his grace had been shed on us that will cause us to walk in meekness and humility and and all of those things and and then be able to show demonstrate meekness our strength under control not feeling like i have to prove my point all the time and and show how much who i am and how much i know and and all of these type of things amen it, it, it's because of his mercy uh, that that we're, we've been made hungry and thirsty for the word of God and for the righteousness of God. You know, when we want what God wants us to have, then we have a hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Amen. It, it, that's over and above our righteousness, over and above our mindsets and our traditions. Amen. We need a strong appetite uh, from God, and that only comes from Him, because it's He that work, that works both us, in us to will and to do of His good pleasure. If it had not been for Him, we wouldn't be here. So, uh, so Jesus said, "Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy." The ones that are expected to show mercy are the ones who have received mercy themselves. Amen. But if we think we deserve everything we have, if we think that God selected us because we were the best of the best, we're the best fruits in the pile, we're the best uh, uh, vegetables in the, in the bin, and he picked through all the vegetables and he found us with the less, less scars, the less marks, the less defects, and he said, oh, I'm going to pick that one because of that. But let me tell you something. I believe God selects the worst so that he could show his glory in the transformation. I believe God selects those uh, that are, are, are not worthy of his mercy, that are not worthy of his thing so that he can then show others how merciful he is and how good he is. So, so if, if, if you and I, if someone received mercy from God, we should be the first ones, amen, to be merciful to others. Amen. Because when, 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 what that would say is that we understand what it means to be weaker and poor. We understand what it means to be lacking in spiritual health and spiritual strength. So we should be more merciful than anybody. It should be easy for those of us who recognize the goodness of God and the mercy of God in our lives to recognize Amen. Those who are in the place that we used to be. Amen. Those that are mourning, those that are 
are, are stressful, those that are uh, mourning in, in the same way that we ourselves mourn when we came close to God. Amen. Amen. We should be the ones that are standing ready. Kingdom citizens should be the ones that are standing at the ready. Amen. To forgive and to restore. I know to the natural mind, this sounds crazy. This sounds like, you know, uh, somebody's getting away with something. And, and, and this is crazy. But this is Jesus teaching. Amen. We should be the first ones to be ready to forgive and to restore. Because Jesus said, he said, uh, uh, that he lets his uh, mercy and his grace shine on the just as well as the unjust. Amen. God does his sun shines on the just as well as the unjust. So he's saying that if you've received mercy, you should be the first ones to give mercy. Amen. And and giving mercy is a real thing. It's not something we create. It's not something we, we make up. Amen. We should be the first ones choosing uh, uh, to think the best in every situation. Uh, you know, I, I've never seen people, you know, sometimes people feel like God can't yet save other people. You know, we uh, we hear about, uh, you know, someone was sharing an example with me of somebody they knew and they knew them before they got saved and they knew how rough they were uh, before they got saved some years later. Uh, somebody told them and informed them that this individual was saved. And they said, what, him? Man, he was a terrible person. And there's no way he's saved and he's a preacher and all this. And I, and I always found it strange that it. how can we think and feel that God can save us, but he can't save somebody else? Amen. The only thing I can say is that unless God haven't really transformed your life, Amen. And you're not really a believer in, in divine transformation and you feel like you've done it on your own and that everything you've accomplished is because of your own thing. Yeah. Then it's hard to believe that God can take a terrible purpose person and change it. But if we really look at our original state before God, God saved us, then then and we understand where he brought us from. Amen. Sometimes we can forget what we were like before God apprehended us and 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 brought us. Sometimes it's easy to block out, amen, where we were as individuals. And then we don't have a sense of the mercy that God has shown on us. Amen. But the, the those that show mercy uh, are the ones that expect the best. I expect the best out of everyone. I expect the best out of my enemies. I, you know, I, I I, you know, I tell myself that even if somebody crossed me two years ago and I see them two years later, I'm always hoping for the best because I feel like God can transform hearts. He can change people. I don't believe just because somebody was some way two years ago, they have to be the same way today because God changed me. So I believe that God can change others. Amen. We should be the first one to expect. Amen. And thank good in every situation. Amen. And say that if God can save me, he can save somebody else. Amen. Amen. And we don't stand in, 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 in the seat of judgment. Amen. Those that show mercy really don't, they, they don't expect more of others than they expect of themselves. Amen. When, until we can expect less of others than we expect of ourselves, or at least not more of others than we expect of ourselves, then it's hard to be able to show mercy on others. Amen. Uh, the, the scripture says, do unto others as you want them to do unto you. Amen. So I always flip the script. How would I want somebody to respond to me in a certain, certain situation? And so I'm trying to do that to others in that situation. Some people can be so suit happy that every little thing happens. They want to sue. They want to, you know, they want to push every button they have and, 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 and take people down. I'm very careful about that because I just believe that sometime we need to step back and let God speak to our hearts. And, and sometime you can be done wrong. Sometime uh, you can be in a situation where someone deserves everything you do. If you take them to the law, if you push the buttons, if they, you know, uh, they take your money, uh, you, you know, you, you can talk them up and down the road if they abuse your, your goodness 
Amen. Sometimes the natural instincts inside is want to pay them back and get them, get back at them. But I just believe that if we, if we, if we take some time, take a deep breath and do some internal reflections and really look at what God done for us and how he brought us and how the type of mercy he's shown on us. Amen. Then we'll come to a place where we can show mercy on others and we really don't expect uh, more of others than respect of ourself, expect of ourself. Amen. We'll, we'll have some compassion left. Amen. For those that are outwardly sinful. You know, sometimes I'm very troubled uh, when I see people that don't have any compassion on people that are that are uh, in the same place they were in before they got saved. Amen. But the merciful uh, know how to have compassion on others when they're out for, outwardly in a sinful condition. Amen. We don't get an attitude. Get You know, it, it's funny to me because uh, me making it in and me being saved and me being transformed, me being uh, uh, making it to heaven as an individual has nothing to do with what anybody else is doing. So I'm comfortable as long as my relationship is solid with my God. I'm comfortable having mercy on somebody. I'm comfortable, amen, uh, being kind and compassionate to others because really it doesn't have anything to do with my salvation. So I, 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 those that show mercy are always compassionate uh, to those that are outwardly sinful because they see themselves as they were, amen. When you can be compassionate on someone that is in bondage of sin, it's because you you, you remember where you were uh, before God took over and, and translated uh, you. Amen. God needs more merciful people because merciful people are concerned about the souls of men. Amen. That's the reason why Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Amen. This is a powerful scripture. Amen. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Amen. Do you need mercy today? Do you need anything from God today? Amen. I'm reminded uh, of, of a scripture just by way of an example uh, found in Matthews 18, 21 to 35. And I just want to read just a little of this and you can study this at, at your own uh, uh, pace. Uh, when I go on, but I want to share a little bit of this because what it really speaks to is that if we want mercy, then it's imperative that we walk in mercy. Amen. Let me say that again. If you and I want mercy from God, uh, then it's imperative that we walk in mercy uh, because there's two things happening here. On one hand, we've already received mercy from God. God is a merciful God. He's already done some things in our lives that have shown his hand of mercy. But there's another side to it, too. We've received mercy, but we're also going to need more mercy. Amen, somebody. We're also going to need some more grace. We're also going to need some more uh, protection from God. Amen. So Jesus what I find interesting about Jesus, Jesus spoke a lot of things, but most of the stuff he was think, was talking about were kingdom principles, things that he felt like was more important than anything in the world. Amen. Jesus talked about practical things, life changing things. He talked about things that are otherworldly. Amen. And 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 he talked about uh, mindsets, characters, and and personalities. He talked about things like that are so, so powerful. So we find here in Luke, I mean, in Matthews 18 and, and 21, Jesus took the time uh, doing his public ministry and, and he took, took the time to teach his people, to teach his disciples because he wanted them to be blessed. Amen, somebody. You might be saying, well, Bishop, Pastor, why are you teaching on such a uh, practical principles like this. You know why? Because I want God's people to be blessed. I, I want God's people to have real blessings, uh, you know, not temporary blessings, not, not, not just things thrown at us. I'm talking about eternal blessings. I'm talking about blessings 
that that means we're storing up things in 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 the not only in the here and now but in the hereafter. We have we have things that are real that we're storing up that God really appreciates. So in verse twenty one here, it says, "Then came Peter uh, to him. You know Peter, one of his one of his." Uh, disciples, he said, on this rock, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. That Peter, uh, Simon Peter, came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? And then he said, should I do it just seven times? And what he was saying in essence is, Lord, how often should I show mercy? How often, uh, should I show mercy on those that are undeserving? Amen. When someone sins against us, when someone offends us, when someone does us wrong, amen, should we forgive them? Should we, should we let it slide? And if so, how many times do we have to do it uh, before it's too much, before it's uh, more than what can bear? But listen what Jesus says in verse number 22. Jesus said unto him, he said, no, not seven times. He said, I say unto you until seven times. Amen. Until seven times, but until, let me read it again. Verse 22, Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times. He said, forget about seven times. And, you know, you know, seven times, a lot of times for somebody to keep doing doing something to you and you keep forgetting them, keep letting them slide, you know, keep letting it go. Amen. Seven times is is uh, is quite a bit. But listen what Jesus says here. He said, but unto 70 times seven. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Have mercy on your people. Amen. He says 70 times seven. And then what he says in 23, he said, therefore, is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king? He said, well, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me give you a demonstration. He said, I, I, I'm trying to show you so I can give you insight uh, on how what the kingdom, how the kingdom operates and how it functions. Amen. He said, he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, uh, heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. So he said there's a certain king and every now and then he'd take account of his servants. And in verse 24, and when he had begun to reckon, amen, with each one, he said when he began to reckon, he said one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. So he was begin to reckon Take account of a servant, one owed him 10,000 cat talents. Amen. He owed him some, owed him something. Amen. And in 25, he said, but uh, for as much as he had not to pay, so he didn't have enough to pay, uh, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and, and payment be made. So hear this, hear this, uh, his Lord, he said, okay, you don't have the money. We're going to sell you. We're going to sell your wife. We're going to sell your children. And, and we go, I'm going to get my money. And you're going to pay me. You owe me. You know, I'm getting what's, what's owed to me. And, and then verse number 26 said, uh, when the servant realized what his, what his Lord was going to do or his master was going to do, the servant, the servant therefore fell down, fell down and worship him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay you. Just give me a break. Give me some time. Let's work out a payment plan. I, I, you know, he wasn't talking about a quarter or a week. He was talking about, really, I want to try to take care of this. I want to try to pay this. So he fell down and he worshiped, said, Lord, I, I just need you to help me. Give me some time to pay it. Now, this is Jesus telling this story. He's trying to get a point across. And, and in 27, uh, he says, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and he, he, he loosed him and he forgave him the debt. Isn't that wonderful? The Lord was moved with compassion and he, and he, he took the took the, the yoke off him, took the 
took the burden off him. He forgave him. He loosed him. He forgave him that debt. But listen what happened. This man that was forgiven and had the family he was trying to protect, Jesus began to really take it to a deeper level in 28. He said, but the same uh, servant went out and found one of his fellow servants. So the same man that had received compassion and the debt was forgiven him. Amen. He went out and found somebody that owes him. Amen. And uh, which owed him a hundred pence. And, and he laid hands on him. He grabbed him uh, and, and he took him by the throat. Now he, he had been forgiven and he goes out and finds somebody that owes him. He puts his hands on him and takes him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe me. Yeah, I'm about to choke him. Tell him, you're going to give me my money. You're going to give it today. Amen. Pay me what you owe. And then 29 says, and his fellow servant fell on his feet just like he did before, fell on his seat and besought him saying, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. And in verse number 30, it says he would not, but went and cast him into prison, locked him up. Amen. And cast him in prison until he should pay his debt. So in 31, it says when his fellow servant saw that he was done, they were very sorry and came and told this unto the Lord of all that was done. So he, they went and told, uh, his fellow servants went and told the, the one that he owed uh, what he had just done. And then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, thou wicked servant. And here's what, here's what Jesus is saying. If you receive mercy and, you, and we fail to show mercy, that makes you and I wicked. Let me let that sink in for a minute. If you and I receive the mercies of God and we refuse to give mercies to those in need of mercy, that makes you and I wicked. It doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter how long we've been who we are. It doesn't matter our title. It doesn't matter our position. It doesn't matter your family. It doesn't matter your church. It doesn't matter any of those things. Jesus is saying here, that if you receive mercy and you refuse to give mercy, that makes you wicked. So he says, then the Lord, then he said, oh, thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all your debt because you desired it of me. Verse 33, he says, shouldn't you have also had compassion on your fellow servant? even as I had pity on you. What made that so hard? And the Lord was angry. He was wroth and he delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due to him. So then 30, in 35, Jesus said, he, he brings it home here. He says, so likewise, likewise my, shall my heavenly father now, he brings it to the spiritual principle. Like my, my heavenly father shall do also unto you. If you from your hearts forgive not every one of his brothers that trespass against them. He said, if you've received mercy, you should be the first one extending mercy. Brothers and sisters, saints and, God, saints and friends, I don't know one believer. I don't want no one saint. I don't know one church person that haven't received mercies from God, our creator. So it shouldn't be one of us not really willing to expand mercies unto others. Amen. Amen. Jesus said in verse 35, again, he says, so likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you if ye from your heart and it has to be real from your heart. Forgive not everyone, his brother, their trespasses from the heart, not just lip service from the heart, from the heart. Do you find it hard to forgive? Do you find it hard to show mercy? Do you find it hard to have compassion for other people? I propose to you that if you find it hard, there's an issue at the heart level. 
there's an issue in the heart level. James uh, uh, 2 and 13 puts it like this. He said, for he shall have judgment without mercy. Talk about God. He's going to have judgment without mercy on those that have showed no mercy. So in other words, God's going to have judgment without mercy when it comes to people that didn't show, that's not willing to show mercy. And mercy rejoices against judgment. He said, I don't want God to have judgment on me without mercy because I refuse to show mercy. Proverbs 3 and 3 puts it like this. It says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. The only way mercy and truth forsake you and me is when we refuse to be merciful to others. Because Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He said, don't let mercy and, few, and, and truth forsake you. What, are you. what do I need to do? Uh, 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 what do I need to do? He said, bind it around your neck. Make it part of everything you do. Bind it around your neck. Write it up on, 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 up on the table of your heart. Get it inside. Make it a part of your life. Amen. Romans put it even a little deeper. Romans 2 and 3 and 4, it says, And thankest thou, O man, this O man, that judges them which do such things. And, and I want this to sink in because if, if, if you've been taught all your life to be mean and to sit and see the judgments, this sounds strange because you think, well, they're getting away. I got to let them know. Listen, if we believe God's word, nobody gets away. Every sin is coming in the judgment. God's going to judge every man, every word. No one gets away. We all have to stand before the judgment seat of God. He's the final say. So, so we have to get out of the mindset that if I don't take care of it, it won't be taken care of. And get more in the mindset that God needs you and I to show mercy, have mercy, to show have compassion, to be able to help those. He said, thinkest thou this old man that judges when thou do such things and doeth the same thing? He said, you know, sometimes people can press down on other folks when they're doing the same thing, but nobody else knows it. I, I think there's a, there is a danger in that. I, I've known people that put their foot on other people's neck, and when it comes to themselves, they take it easy on themselves. I think there's a danger in that. There's a double judgment that's going to come. He said, do you think you're going to escape the judgment of God? Amen. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness and his and forbearance and his long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance? Amen. Every one of us have received the goodness of God that believe his long suffering, his goodness, his forbearance. But here's the thing. God's goodness, God's mercy should lead every man to repentance. Repentance. Lord, I repent. I'm sorry that you had mercy on me, but I'm struggling to walk in mercy for others. It should lead to repentance. It should lead to his goodness. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Lord, I need some more mercy. Oh, I need, I need it. I need, you know, I want so much mercy until when it's time for me to cross the threshold to go into heaven. I want, I want, I want, uh, I hope there's a bucket with some blood and some mercy and they brush just a little bit more on me. Amen. Blessed are those that show mercy. Why? Because they shall receive mercy. The more mercy we show, the more mercy we shall receive. Brothers and sisters, friends, it's time that we partner with heaven. It's time that we get our wills in alignment with God's will. Jesus didn't teach these things just so they can just have a bleep in his ministry. I don't believe Jesus taught the, the Beatitudes. I don't believe he taught these, these lessons so that they'll be on the back burner 
and all of the, the other stuff be on the forefront. I believe Jesus taught these things because these were critical principles for salvation and kingdom business. I believe Jesus taught those things because he wanted his people to partner with him and emulate these things in a dying world so that as many as could would be saved. When, when you and I walk in mercy, we're, the, we're partnering with the di divine will of heaven. When you and I walk in these principles, we're partner. But remember this, these things can only be re realized through the new birth. You know, if you find it difficult to walk in these principles, it, 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 it's because transformation is not full, it's not complete. But when we're transformed and we let the mind that's in Christ be in us, then it's easy to walk in these principles. If they don't make sense, then we, we need to be praying, Lord, open up my spiritual insight so I can, so I can see the way heaven sees, so I can feel what heaven feels, and I can get in alignment with your, 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 your will. That's the reason why Jesus told Nicodemus in St. John's 3 and 3, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you're born again, you can't see, you can't perceive the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's strange to you if you're not born again. Amen. That's the reason why we need to partner with heaven and pray the prayer that Jesus prayed. Like he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it, as it is in heaven. Amen. I, 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 I'm really happy here. Amen. Like First Chronicles says in Chronicles, First Chronicles 16 and 34 that I'm looking at here, it says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Why? For his good, for he is good and his mercies endure forever. Let me repeat that in your hearing again. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord. Why? For he is good and his mercies endure forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercies. I thank you that they endure forever. Father, everyone at the, under the sound of my voice, we want to partner with heaven. And we're praying that your kingdom come and your will be done. We're praying that you would put more workers in the vineyard because the harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. We pray that you would stir up more souls to understand that their lack in the spiritual realm and how much we need you and how much we need your wisdom from above. We're praying that you would stir up more to can see what you see, see what heaven sees and feel what heaven feels and be able to mourn for victory. Lord God, send more meek souls that can go out in meekness and, and, and have strength and power under control and be able to connect with those that are lost and be a blessing to a dying world. Give us more hunger, give us more thirst, give, give more people a desire of you, not just selfish things, but desire of you. Oh, Father, so that then we can see things the way they are and we can walk in mercy, we can live in mercy, and we can thank you for your mercy because it endures forever. Do it for your people. Start at the household of faith. Show us, Lord God, how to walk in victory. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brothers and sisters. Uh, we'll see you next week. If you haven't already, and if this these lessons are a blessing to you, I really strongly encourage that you would share it with somebody else. Amen. Uh, give it to somebody else. Tell them to listen to the whole series. Amen. And tell them to go through it. Amen. The whole series. Share it with somebody else. And we just thank those of you that are listening and participating with this. And we thank God for all of your love gifts that you have sent to this ministry. It's truly been a blessing to us. It's truly been a strength to us, especially in this difficult time uh, that we're in. Amen. Every time uh, we receive 
the, the tithes, the offerings, and the love gifts, it strengthens us. It lets us know that we're not just out here and, uh, uh, just blowing hot air, that we're impacting lives and that we're, we're, we're touching souls. So uh, if you haven't already, uh, go to our website, uh, www.breadhouseministries.org. And, and get connected to us. And it has the placards and things on how to stay connected and how to uh, become a member of our YouTube page, etc. Amen. So we thank God for you. God bless you. And we'll see you next week as we continue our series on partnering with heaven. See you next time. Thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. We hope and pray that the Word of God has enriched your life and blessed your soul. Please take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube page and like us on Facebook. To stay connected with upcoming services and events, please visit us at www.breadhouseministries.org or click the link in the description below for more information. We hope that you enjoyed today's broadcast. Instructions on how to give online are simple and easy. Just visit www.breadhouseministries.org. Scroll down, click Give, then register your giving profile and start giving today. For questions, you can contact our church at 517-485-4209. Thank you for your support.